We've all seen this kind of situation, the crack in the wall, the ants coming into our kitchen or our bathroom searching for food. And when they find it, being able to attract all their little friends so quickly so that they can collectively devour whatever we dropped on the floor. You've probably seen the vast trail systems that they can create in your backyard or in a public park somewhere. Ants are really amazing in their ability to collectively forage for food in a very efficient way. We talked about this a little bit in Unit 1, and we're going to revisit it here in this unit along with some other amazing behaviors of ant colonies. So the basic idea of ant foraging, as we talked about in Unit 1, is that ants come out of a nest and move around randomly in different directions. When an ant encounters a food source, it brings some food back to the nest, but leaving a pheromone trail, where pheromone is a kind of chemical excreted by the ant that attracts other ants. Ants encountering the trail are likely to follow it. In the absence of reinforcement, the pheromone will dissipate. But as long as ants continue to follow the pheromone trail and continue to find food, then they'll continue to reinforce it. Here's a video of a famous experiment that's been repeated many times in which ants are given the choice of two different paths to food. A long path, like this one, and a shorter path. Well, the shorter path ends up attracting more ants, finally all of them, because the pheromone is able to remain reinforced on the shorter side more than it is on the longer side. These ants, if they go down this way, their pheromone evaporates often before other ants get to follow it. So here we go. You can see the ants very reliably following this trail. A few of them manage to go over here. There is some randomness in what they do, but for the most part they're following this shorter path to the food. You probably remember this model, Ants New. It consists of an uh, ant's nest and three food sources, and it models ant foraging along the lines of the algorithm I just described to you. So if we do go, let me slow it down a little bit, the ants go out from the nest. If one of them encounters food, they're moving around randomly. If one of them encounters food, they take it back to the nest, laying a pheromone trail. Let's run that again. So you can see it more slowly. And other ants are attracted to the pheromone trail. They'll follow it. But if the trail is not reinforced by ants, like if the food source dries up, the trail evaporates eventually. See this trail evaporating. But if there still is food along the trail, then the ants will find it and will reinforce the pheromone trail. So in this way, the ants are able to build a kind of model using their trails to represent what they know collectively about their food environment. Using this model, we can do an experiment to see what actually is the role of the pheromone in helping the ants find the food. So to do that, I'm going to do a simple experiment where I'm going to turn off the pheromone. To do that, I'm going to put the evaporation rate at its highest level, which means that the pheromone will evaporate so fast that the ants can't sense it. So let's see what happens then. So here, the ants have no pheromone to sense. They're just randomly finding food. They're not interacting with one another. And we'll see how long it takes them. I just speeded it up. This the whole simulation stops when all the food is gone. Okay, and it took them 538 ticks to find all the food when there were 500 ants. I'll, I'll m mark that down here. We'll say no pheromone, five, uh, 538 ticks to find the food. So now let's turn the pheromone back on again. We'll put it down to two, a very low evaporation rate and we'll see how that affects the behavior. Of course, because there's a lot of randomness, if I really wanted to get accurate numbers here, I'd have to do this many times. I'm actually going to let you do that in your homework and average the results. But I'll just do this informal test here. So we'll see if there's a change in the amount of time it takes for all the food to be gone. And indeed, this time it only took 415 ticks.
So we'll say with pheromone, 415 ticks. So this simplified model lets us have some intuition about the role of pheromone in helping ants efficiently forage for food. Just to reiterate, for ants that are foraging at any given time, the existing trails and the concentration of pheromone along those trails encode the colony's collective information about its food environment. Moreover, the information is able to adapt to changes in environmental conditions. Once the food is eaten, for example, the trails will evaporate. And if new food is found, then new trails will be formed. So in this way, the ants are able to adaptively forage, even in a changing environment. Now I want to briefly mention another kind of self-organizing behavior in ant colonies, and that's the notion of task allocation. Deborah Gordon is a biologist at Stanford University who has done extensive work on, on many behaviors in ant colonies, but in particular we're going to talk about her work on task allocation. According to her, task allocation is the process that adjusts the number of workers engaged in each task in a way appropriate to the current situation. Task allocation operates without central or hierarchical control. It's a self-organizing activity. Gordon has studied task allocation in harvester ants, a particular kind of ant. In this kind of ant, workers in a colony divide themselves among a number of tasks. Nest maintenance, looking around, cleaning up the nest. Here's a picture of a nest. Patrolling, foraging, refuse sorting, and so on. So here are some representative pictures of different kinds of ants doing different kinds of tasks. But the question is, how is it at any given time that ants decide what task they should be doing. And it turns out that ants actually switch tasks according to what's going on in their environment. So the number of workers pursuing each kind of task adapts to changes in the environment due to weather, food availability, predators, and so on. For example, Gordon showed that if the nest is disturbed, the number of nest maintenance workers will increase and the number of foragers will decrease. More ants are taking on the task of nest maintenance when it's needed and fewer are taking on the task of foraging. And she was able to do this experiment by putting toothpicks at different places around the nest and the ants really didn't like this evidently. And so the number of nest maintenance workers to remove the toothpicks increased. She also found that if the food supply is large and high quality, the number of foragers will increase. In short, ants are able to choose tasks according to what tasks need the most attention. And they also look at how many other ants are already doing these tasks. How do they do this? What's evident is that ants are not able to get the big picture of what's going on in their environment. They only interact locally with other ants and have to learn about what's going on globally from limited interactions, similar to the other self-organizing systems that we've seen. So here's the question in a nutshell. How does an individual ant decide which task to adopt in response to nest-wide environmental conditions, even though no ant directs the decision of any other ant and each ant interacts only with a small number of other ants? Well, here's what Gordon found by doing extensive experiments. She found that ants decide to adopt a particular task, such as foraging or patrolling or nest maintenance, as a function of two things. One, what they encounter in the environment, and two, their rate of interaction with ants performing different tasks. An ant might encounter a toothpick or some other debris on their nest, and that would possibly make them switch to do nest maintenance. But also, they're influenced by what other ants they come into contact with. Gordon found that ants can actually tell what job another ant has been doing by sensing chemical residues on its antennae, on the antennae of the other ant. Here's a little video that Deborah Gordon's research group took using a video scope inside an ant nest. And here you can see 
ants coming out of the nest and into the nest and actually touching each other with their antennae and that way they can sense what job another ant has been doing. If ants coming out of the nest sense many foragers coming back with food then they will be more likely to adopt the task of being a forager. So ants act as little statisticians. They measure the rate of interaction of the ants that they encounter doing different tasks. Those rates are one of the things that they use to decide what task to adopt. It's not known how the brain of an ant is able to do this, but it seems from the data that Gordon and her research collaborators have taken that that is exactly what the ants are somehow doing. So here's a little puzzle. Gordon and her colleagues observed that larger ant colonies are more deterministic and consistent in task allocation than smaller ant colonies. Why do you think this is? Pause the video for just a minute and think about it. Why would a larger ant colony be in some sense better at optimally allocating tasks in a consistent and deterministic way than smaller colonies? Well, the hypothesis that Gordon and her colleagues put forth is that ants in larger colonies basically can get better statistics on interaction rates because they have more samples. Each ant has, on average, more samples of interactions with other ants, and so they get better statistics. So next time you see ants in your kitchen or your bathroom or out in your garden or even crawling on your leg, just remember that ants are very brilliant little statisticians. Think how great it would be if we could somehow take advantage of their statistical abilities.